I guarantee you that if you ask most OBGYNs what their worst nightmare is, they're going to say shoulder dystocia. I'm Dr. Ali, I'm an OBGYN, and today we're gonna to talk about shoulder dystocia. If you guys have been at all active on social media, have seen the news, then you know exactly why I'm bringing this up. I made this TikTok about this case that happened in Georgia. I will not be talking about this case specifically because I was not there, you were not there, I do not know the details. And obviously we're just seeing a one-sided view from the attorney that's taking care of this family. So I can't speak on specifics, but I will go into shoulder dystocia, what it is, risk factors, and I'll be going over maneuvers that me as an OBGYN have been trained on to help relieve a shoulder dystocia. All right, let's jump into it. I asked you all over on Instagram to leave me questions that you may have about shoulder dystocia. So I'm gonna be answering those questions throughout the video and you'll kind of see them pop up on the screen. So what is a shoulder dystocia? Ultimately, this is an unpredictable and unpreventable obstetrical emergency. And this emergency puts the mom's life and the baby's life at risk. Here's exactly what happens during a shoulder dystocia. You get to complete and you start pushing. As you push, your baby comes down the birth canal. Then, as you start crowning where the baby's head starts to deliver, the baby's head delivers, and then me, as an OBGYN, I'm trained with just gentle traction on the fetal head or the baby's head. That little baby will then just deliver. With a shoulder dystocia, even if I apply gentle traction on the baby's head, it's not delivering. This is because the baby's shoulders are stuck behind the symphysis pubis or the mom's bone. I'm gonna show a picture here. So as you can see from the picture, the baby's anterior shoulder or the shoulder closest to that symphysis pubis is stuck. So this is technically a bone on bone problem. So if the baby's shoulders stay in the anterior posterior position, it's gonna continue to rub up against that symphysis pubis and the baby won't be able to be delivered. So I'll go into maneuvers later, but essentially you either wanna move the baby's shoulders to get them out of that position, or you wanna position the mom in a certain way to get that symphysis pubis out of the way. Now, what are some risk factors for shoulder dystocia? First and foremost, I want you to know that there are a list of risk factors for shoulder dystocia, but you should know that these risk factors have a poor predictive value. Meaning that even if you have these risk factors, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have a shoulder dystocia. Also, most shoulder dystocias actually occur in patients that have zero risk factors. Now, the incidence of shoulder dystocia is pretty low. We see it in about 0.2 to 3% of deliveries. So rest assured that this is something that's very uncommon. One of the risk factors for shoulder dystocia is having a very big baby. This is what's called fetal macrosomia. Another risk factor is the mom having diabetes throughout the pregnancy. We do know that diabetic mothers tend to make bigger babies and this leads to fetal macrosomia. And typically the weight distribution on these babies is that their abdomen or their bellies are a lot bigger than the head. As you can imagine, the head delivers without any issues, but because the abdomen and those shoulders are going to be bigger, then they're more likely to get stuck behind that bone. But again, remember, most shoulder dystocias occur in patients that have zero risk factors. So what are some of the potential maternal complications with shoulder dystocia? If you have a shoulder dystocia, you're more likely to have a postpartum hemorrhage and more likely to have a higher degree tear, meaning a perineal tear, things like a third degree or fourth degree laceration. Also at an increased risk of having femoral nerve neuropathy, and this is due to the hyperflexion that we sometimes have to position the mother in to get the baby out. Now, with extreme maneuvers to try and relieve the shoulder dystocia, which I'm gonna get into later, the mother can suffer from deeper cervical vaginal lacerations, uterine rupture, injury to the urethra, bladder, urinary incontinence. But again, these are associated with those kind of extreme maneuvers that I'll go over at the end. Now, what are some of the neonatal complications or risks to the baby during a shoulder dystocia? Let me start off by saying that most cases of shoulder dystocia, actually the babies have no complications. The shoulder dystocia is relieved and the babies are fine. The most common injury that we see is a brachial plexus injury. The brachial plexus, as you can see from this picture, is a group of nerves in the neck. An injury to these nerves are seen more frequently with shoulder dystocia because of some of the maneuvers and some of the traction that's placed on the baby's neck. Other injuries that we see are a humerus fracture or a fracture of the baby's arm. 
or a fracture of the baby's clavicle. But again, even with the brachial plexus injury or any sort of fractures on their bones, babies typically don't have any long-term complications from these injuries. Now, the scariest risk factor with shoulder dystocia and why we worry so much as obstetricians is that there is an increased risk of neonatal encephalopathy or brain damage and fetal death. Now you may be asking, how is this possible? How can a baby die from this? Well, if we think about it, as I mentioned before, the fetal head or the baby's head delivers and it's stuck. You can't deliver the rest of its body. As that baby is stuck, you're gonna have a lot of compression of the baby's neck. This can lead to a lot of stimulation of the baby's vagus nerve. It could also lead to decreased oxygen to the brain because of the compression on the neck. So if you have decreased cerebral blood flow or blood flow to the brain, you can then lead to things like neonatal encephalopathy, which is brain damage because the baby's losing oxygen. And ultimately, if the shoulder dystocia happens for a long time, it can lead to death. Can a shoulder dystocia happen again? Say you had a shoulder dystocia with your first pregnancy, what are the chances that it's gonna happen again in a next pregnancy? But happening again in a subsequent pregnancy is about 10%. It's super important that you have a discussion with your provider if you have had a shoulder dystocia. A lot of the times a shoulder dystocia can be very traumatic. So with patients that have had shoulder dystocia, I do offer them, and most OBGYNs do, offer them a C-section for their next pregnancy. It's gonna look different person to person, but a lot of the times if it was such a traumatic event or led to encephalopathy for the baby, maybe a fracture, maybe an injury, something like that, and the patient doesn't want to experience that trauma again, then it is very reasonable to schedule a C-section for the next pregnancy. Now, that doesn't mean you have to have a C-section if you've had a shoulder dystocia, but again, every pregnancy is different, so it's important to have this conversation with your doctor. What if you do have fetal macrosomia, or you know that you have a very big baby? Do we need to do a C-section in order to avoid a shoulder dystocia from happening? And the answer is no. Remember, that most patients experience a shoulder dystocia when there's no risk factors. But say we did do it. Say everyone that had a big baby, we ended up just doing a C-section for, is it really going to decrease the number of shoulder dystocias? And the answer is no. You would only increase the rate of C-sections while not having an effect on the rate of shoulder dystocia. Now, there are some guidelines as far as when we would offer a C-section depending on the size of the baby. If you have no complications with the pregnancy and your baby is weighing more than 5,000 grams, which is about more than 11 pounds, then at that point, ACOG or the American College of OBGYNs does recommend that we offer that patient an elective C-section because an 11 pound baby is a very big baby. Now, if you are a diabetic mother or have diabetes throughout the pregnancy and your baby is measuring more than 4,500 grams or about 9.9 .9 pounds, then it would be reasonable to offer you a C-section, again, because those babies of diabetic mothers tend to have a larger belly and a higher rate of shoulder dystocias. But again, all conversations you need to have with your OBGYN so that you understand the risks and the benefits involved. So how do I, as an OBGYN, manage a shoulder dystocia? In our residency training, we are trained on a systematic approach to shoulder dystocias, but again, not every patient and not every baby is going to be the same. So while there is kind of an order of different maneuvers to try, sometimes when you're in the moment and you see the whole clinical picture, it's okay to kind of go out of order, but this is just, again, a systematic approach. Let's get into it. First, the most important thing that I can do is that when I identify a shoulder dystocia, I let everyone in the room know. I let my whole team know. I let my labor and delivery nurse know. I let the patient know. I notify the charge nurse. I notify the pediatrics or the NICU team if they're in the room. And I let anesthesia know. I also designate someone to start the timer because I wanna know how long the shoulder dystocia actually lasts. Number two, most importantly, do not push. It's important that as the patient, you listen to your clinical team and you don't push. A lot of the times during a shoulder dystocia, it can be very chaotic and very traumatic. And sometimes I hear family members or maybe a nurse say, push, push harder, get them out. 
and that's actually going to make the shoulder dystocia worse. Remember, this is a bone on bone problem. That anterior shoulder is rubbing against the mom's symphysis pubis. So even if she's pushing and pushing, she's only going to make that dystocia worse because you're pushing against bone. The first maneuver that we try is what's called McRoberts. This is going to be a simple and a very effective maneuver in helping relieve the shoulder dystocia. That means it's positioning the maternal legs in a hyper flexed position to, to help cause that symphysis pubis to rotate cephalad and hopefully relieve the shoulder dystocia. Here's a picture of it. Second maneuver is what's called super pubic pressure. First, you do McRoberts. You bring the mom's legs all the way back where her knees are to her chest. And me as an OBGYN, I instruct my nurse to give me super pubic pressure. What that means is she makes a fist with her hand and she's putting pressure on the mom's pubic bone and she's attempting to kind of move that anterior shoulder out of the way. Very important if you are the nurse doing this that you listen to your provider because it's not just pressure downward. You want to do downward lateral pressure because if you just do downward pressure, you're again further putting that shoulder against the symphysis pubis. But if you do lateral rotation, you can kind of get that bone to move one way or the other. So listen to your provider to know which way to give the pressure. Another thing not to do, which I've seen, do not give fundal pressure. A lot of the times during a shoulder dystocia, family members or someone in the room wants to push on the fundus or the top of the uterus to help push that baby out. This is actually very dangerous. One, again, you're just furthering that bone on bone obstruction, but two, it can actually lead to uterine rupture. What if you've done McRoberts and super pubic pressure and that still doesn't work? My next option would be delivery of the posterior arm. This is where I place one hand inside of the vagina and I try to get that arm that's behind and hopefully by relieving that baby's posterior arm, you deliver the little arm and the rest of the little body follows. Just doing these three maneuvers actually relieves most shoulder dystocias, which is really reassuring. But say McRoberts super pubic pressure and delivery of the posterior arm don't work, what's my next go-to? I can then do rotational maneuvers. These are gonna be either the Reuben or the wood screw maneuver. Again, this is where I place one hand inside of the vagina and I'm trying to do these rotational maneuvers on the baby to get those shoulders out of the anterior posterior position. What if that doesn't work? What's next? I could also try a sling traction where I get a Foley catheter and I sling it around the posterior shoulder with some traction to try to get that baby delivered. What if that doesn't work? Then I can try what's called the Gaskin maneuver. This is a maneuver where the patient is now placed on all fours. It can be pretty challenging if the patient does have an epidural. It's still possible, but it's more challenging. But it works well if there's no epidural because the patient moves on all fours and sometimes that rotation of moving the patient on her hands and knees repositions the pelvis and the baby and allows you to deliver. So say you're doing all these things and still that baby's not delivering, what do you do next? You repeat your maneuvers and you continue to repeat them to see if something changes and something works. Now you do have the option of cutting an episiotomy or intentionally cutting a tear into the mom's perineum. This is not done to relieve the shoulder dystocia, but to give you more room. Say the issue is that I can't grab that posterior arm or I can't do my rotational maneuvers because I simply don't have the room to do it. By cutting an episiotomy, it allows me to get my hands further inside of the vagina to try and deliver the baby. Another maneuver you can try is intentionally breaking the baby's clavicle. Clavicle is going to be this bone right here. By intentionally breaking the clavicle of the infant, it allows you to change the diameter of the shoulder. If the shoulder's like this, now they're rotated more like this and more likely to go underneath that pelvic bone. Obviously this sounds very extreme, but like I mentioned before, even with breaking the clavicle, most babies have no long-term consequences because of this. Sometimes they just do a little arm sling and then they get better within a couple weeks. Say you've done all of these maneuvers over and over again and nothing is working. You cannot deliver this baby. What's next? These are going to be called maneuvers of last resort. These maneuvers that I'm gonna talk about are extremely aggressive and in a lot of cases, they're not even recommended because they increase the morbidity of the mother. I personally have never had to do them. I know one physician that's had to do them and it is a very traumatic experience for everyone involved. Doctor, the nurses, the patient, it's pretty traumatic. One of these maneuvers is called the Zalvanelli. This is where again, remember the baby's head's already delivered. So you would take the baby's head 
and push it up inside of the uterus and rush back to do an emergency c-section again is going to increase the maternal morbidity and it's also going to increase the morbidity and mortality of that baby next is going to be what's called a symphysiotomy honestly this one is so traumatic to the mother globally it's not recommended to do this. This is going to be where you surgically remove and separate the cartilage between the symphysis pubis. I'll show you a picture here, but you would go and cut that cartilage between those bones, obviously giving you the ability to manipulate those bones and get a bigger opening to get that baby out. The problem with this is that cartilage does not grow back together. So this is going to lead to a lot of issues with the mom. It can affect her quality of life significantly. A lot of the times they then have issues walking later in life, a lot of pelvic pain, have to go through a lot of physical therapy. With the way the maneuver is done, it can actually lead to bladder injuries and injuries to the urethra. So a lot of these patients then suffer from long-term urinary incontinence, bladder issues, and the quality to the mother's life is so significantly diminished that it is not recommended. So what happens in these extreme cases where you do all of these things and you still cannot get that baby delivered? What now? I have personally never heard of anyone having to do this and I can't even imagine what that would look like. And I do not say this lightly and I do not say this to scare you. This is extremely rare, like extremely, extremely, extremely rare. But if you have no other option, then separation or decapitation may be necessary. If you find yourself in this situation, the shoulder dystocia has been going on for so long that at this point, the baby has passed. There would never be a situation where a provider would intentionally decapitate a living baby. That's just simply not a thing, that's unheard of, it's not in our training, and it would never happen. I hate to end on that note, but that's it. That is shoulder dystocia in a nutshell. I hope this video helped answer some of your guys' questions. Let me know if there's any other topics or other questions that you have about shoulder dystocia. Just leave them below in the comments. I love you guys. Thank you so much for all of the love and support, and I'll see you in my next video. Bye!